Ladies and gentlemen, again, hello, welcome to our webinar devoted to non-financial reporting. My name is Bartosz Kwiatkowski, I'm director of Polish branch of Frankvolt. It's a great pleasure to have uh, all of you today with us. Um, we are expecting more than 100 participant, participants representing a very broad spectrum of uh, stakeholders, reporting companies, investors, banks, public authorities, representatives, uh, CSOs, um, and academics. Uh, today's event is possible thanks to support of um, European Climate Initiative, OIKI, which is financed by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, nat Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. At this place, I would also like to thank you, thanks to our communications um, support and patrons, including Responsible Business Forum from Poland, the Croatian Institute for CSR, and Romanian Investors uh, Relations Association. Today's uh, webinar uh, is organized by Frank Bolt within the project called Alliance for Corporate uh, Transparency, uh, which is created and coordinated by uh, Frank Bolt. We brought together uh, leading civil society organization and experts and uh, we started to work on non-financial reporting agenda. Here you can see who is supporting us, who's working with us, uh, and um, who delivered us uh, technical uh, support during this, uh, this whole project, this whole uh, analysis uh, we did during uh, last year. Uh, we decided to carry out the largest study on corporate sustainability uh, reporting to date. Uh, during the last two years, we assessed almost 1,500 reports. We started in 2018 with the test of 100 reports. Later, last year, we did an enormous number of analyses, including 1,000 reports from companies across whole Europe. And this year, we focus on 300 companies, mostly from Southern and Central and Eastern Europe. We analyzed the information on climate and environmental issues. Uh, among these 303 companies from this year, 73 are, come, are from Poland. Uh, however, what's very important, analyzing reports is it's not our main aim. Uh, as you probably know, when I'm addressing this information to um, reporting companies, we are not publishing specific results of each company. Uh, the, only, the only entities which get the specific information, the specific results, are the assessed companies. However, we publish the general outcome of our analysis uh, because we want to deliver uh, evidence-based recommendations to improve and develop the EU non-financial reporting legislation and framework. Uh, that's our, our main um, aim and main uh, outcome we hope to reach next year. However, we also want to use um, Alliance for Corporate Transparency as an open platform to discuss policy proposals on corporate transparency with civil society organizations, companies, and investors. So today, this event is also connected with this uh, second um, aim of our project. Uh, before presenting today's agenda, I would also like to briefly describe our next steps in Alliance of Corporate Transparency. Uh, which will happen next year. We'll start around uh, February with publishing um, the new version, the second version of our guidance on uh, reporting related to climate issues. Uh, the first version was published by us uh, around June uh, this year. The second version will be uh, broader, uh, will include more information on uh, practical aspects of reporting and will include more good practices. We also um, plan to focus more on dialogue uh, between uh, stakeholders. We would like to plan to engage next year more actively uh, in discussion with companies and investors. So far, we are uh, cooperating currently with 30 multinational enterprises. Uh, so hopefully next year it will be uh, even broader. We also would like uh, to work on feedback on what policymakers can do uh, to help companies uh, especially in the area of, of standardization and clarification of methodologies used in non-financial reporting. Uh, going to the agenda of today's um, event, we'll have three main parts uh, of the event. Um, first of all, we'll start with presentation of the policy context, which will be presented by Philip Gregor from Frankbolt Responsible Companies. Uh, 
uh, and at the same time the member of the European Corporate Reporting Lab at EFRAC. Uh, Philip will be uh, partnered by Michael Zimoni uh, from Climate Disclosure, Disclosure Standards Board, who is the Policy and External Affairs uh, Director. Uh, afterwards, Okay, that's the question. Uh, afterwards, um, this first presentation, we have the second part uh, presented by Katarzyna Kluczka, a lawyer from Polish branch of Frank Bolt, who is the uh, lead Polish uh, researcher uh, who coordinated the team of our researchers here in Poland and is responsible for uh, assessment of, uh, of substantial number uh, of reports. The third, and in my opinion, the most interesting part, uh, would be uh, expert commentaries uh, on non-financial reporting. Probably, I hope that we'll, we'll hear that uh, non-financial reporting agenda is uh, very significant and should develop further. Uh, we invited experts from very different areas, um, experts um, representing investors that would be uh, Robert Sroka, uh, director, ESG director of Abris Capital Partner, uh, which uh, manages uh, $1.3 billion uh, of committed capital through free uh, investment funds and covers at the same time uh, 30,500 employees. We also invited uh, Daniela Sherban, president and co-founder of Romanian Investor Relation Association, uh, whose mission is to provide current and potential issuers a platform for the development of investor relations professionals. We have also the representative of bank, uh, Sara Forshek, uh, who is the sustainability officer at Raiffeisen Bank Austria in Croatia, the first bank in Croatia to have been funded with foreign uh, capital. Uh, we also have representatives of reporting companies. Uh, Yolanta uh, Domirska, the head of environment protection team and ESG, uh, climate area from Tauron Polska Energia, one of the biggest Polish energy companies delivering electricity to more than 5.5 million people with an equity of over 19 billion zlotys and more than 25,000 employees. And last but not least, we have a representative of public authority, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Kacprzak, uh, the representative of the Ministry of Development Funds and Regional Policy, and at the same time, uh, a representative of um, Polish OECD National Contact Point, which already has delivered its good offices in the case, uh, in the case concerning NFR. Uh, unfortunately, we'll be missing one um, speaker from BNP Paribas due to personal issues. Uh, please feel free to uh, use Q&A, uh, to use chat, ask us questions during the, the webinar if it will be possible to answer your questions during the webinar, uh, then we'll do it. Uh, if we don't have time for that, we'll try to uh, uh, answer any questions uh, via uh, email. Uh, please uh, don't worry, at the closing part, the last uh, you can see in the agenda, I won't be speaking for 15 minutes to close the webinar, uh, so it, it's, I hope that it will be uh, shorter. I hope that this event will be interesting and useful for all of you especially in the context of expected uh, legal changes on the EU and national level, which will be presented by uh, Philip and Michael. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bertik, and welcome all. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to see such a, such a, such a high number of uh, participants. So we'll kick off with, uh, with a brief overview of the policy landscape and of the upcoming changes to the European non-financial reporting legislation. And I'll be joined uh, by Michael Zimoni, who's, well, as, as Bartek said, the Policy and External Affairs uh, Director of the CDSB. CDSB stands for the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and it is an international consortium of business and environmental NGOs. And the commitment of the CDSB is to advance and align the global mainstream corporate reporting model to equate natural capital with financial capital. And CDSB is among the five major reporting standard setters and frameworks alongside CDP, IR, CGRI, and SASB that, that is playing uh, now a critical role in the process of international standardization. So, Mike, um, may I ask you, what is the current policy landscape? What is happening in the European Union and beyond? And actually, before I let you speak, I should mention that CDSB is an advisory member to the Alliance for Corporate Transparency. So, Mike, 
what's uh, what's happening in the policy world thank you very much philip and thank you very much uh, to frank bolt for having us uh, having me uh, speak to you today so it's, it's always a pleasure to, to join your webinars i think the short answer is that there is a lot happening um, and and uh, i think it's also interesting to look at why this is happening um, i think it's it's uh, becoming ever more evident that uh, the impacts of physical risks uh, of and, and also transition risks from climate change uh, and, and other environmental matters on the global economy has really increased in the recent decades. Uh, back in um, the 1980s, uh, there were, we were, you know, it was estimated that these risks amounted to about uh, 500 billion US dollars uh, globally, uh, and now we're looking at over one and a half trillion dollars. And this is a, a recent, this is actually was uh, from a recent report by the Financial Stability Board, a global consortium of central bankers uh, launched just a few weeks ago. So we are seeing that uh, these, uh, these issues are really increasing. And so there is a strong policy initiative to address these risks, both for society, but also for financial markets. And um, on top of that, of course, we are going through a current pandemic, which has really refocused uh, the way policymakers think even further. And when, when they are discussing, of course, uh, recovery packages, the issue of environmental matters and climate change are central at their discussions because they do not want to fund something that will uh, become a loss further down the line. So we have seen a significant uh, push in, in sustainable finance uh, policy, both in Europe, but also internationally. So the two, perhaps the two main uh, drivers uh, to this day were, of course, the European Green Deal and, of course, the COVID recovery uh, discussions. But also uh, we are ahead of the renewed sustainable finance strategy coming up in the next few years, uh, which, will, which are very much likely to be tightening and increasing uh, policy pressures further. We have seen, uh, of course, the European Non-Financial Reporting Directive being reopened, and within that, uh, there is a clear uh, signal from the European Commission that the current level of disclosures are not meeting the purposes of the directive. That is, they're not informing uh, investors and other stakeholders. Information is not consistent, comparable. Sometimes there is too much. Sometimes there is too little information. It is not yet at the state where it is effectively informing the decisions of various stakeholders. So there is a strong push uh, in Europe, but also globally to, to, to go further. Within this, in Europe, of course, uh, Philip, you are very familiar with this. Uh, the, uh, the Commission has also requested EFRAG, the European Financial Reporting and Advisory Group, which is in charge of uh, implementing international financial reporting standards to also assess the potential implementation of non-financial reporting standards to create more clarity and consistency in Europe on the way non-financial information uh, must be reported. To this, uh, the Commission has also added a whole host of uh, other initiatives. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have come across the discussions around uh, uh, the taxonomies in Europe and really other levers to push the investing, investment community to take these issues uh, more closely into their, uh, into their day to day activities. But uh, as the financial system is transforming, that is of course also reflecting corporate disclosure practices. So whatever an investor uh, will need to look at will most likely need to come from a company. So we are also very likely to be expecting increased pressures from the investment world as well to request information on, on non-financial matters. So there are, there are two main elements that are happening, both from the uh, policy perspective uh, generally, and, and that is very much addressing real and current uh, financial losses and, and risks that are, that are materializing, but also a more transition of the entire financial system. And the last point I also wanted to make uh, here is that this is not uh, only happening in Europe, but also happening internationally. And in today's international market, it's important to think about what else is happening outside of Europe. Uh, the United Kingdom has just the other week uh, uh, stated that it will be implementing the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, the TCFD, across its entire market. Other, other jurisdictions um, have, are very active in this, both in South America, uh, Canada, Australia, Japan, and so we are really seeing a push internationally 
to to advance this area and really make this type of information and 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 you know financial decision making around uh, sustainability matters a mainstream issue because it needs to be addressed from a financial stability perspective but also of course from a greater policy perspective to make sure that we we end up in the, in the of course in the in the world and the society that we want as a as a global society so perhaps my main message is there's a lot happening and we need to uh, start thinking about uh, making sure that we are up to date with that what's happening and 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 uh, and be ready for for uh, further changes to be happening thank you mike the, the the last time we spoke on a similar event you uh in terms of the international developments you presented the case of new zealand being the first country advancing on implementing the task force uh, on climate related financial disclosures into 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 the law and a lot has happened since then it seems <laughs> now it's the uk not just not just new uh, new zealand out of all uh, places but i guess the, the message here is that the amount of money that is starting to move in the financial sector towards climate uh, transition and, and so on and so forth is staggering i remember a figure from a couple of years back when it was an estimate how much investment is needed to meet just the modest uh, 2030 goals of the eu it was like 180 billion of euro and now we're probably speaking about something in a, in a, in a of much bigger uh, magnitude but the question of course is um moving towards what what kind of data is really critical in this uh, in this uh, in this regard and i wanted to ask you what's your take on the on the results of our research that, uh, that the participants will see in a moment and knowing that cdsb has carried out its own analysis on using fairly well aligned methodology with uh, with ours but focusing on on uh, other 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 companies i think it's it's uh, it was actually quite a useful exercise for us to also do a, a an analysis and see your analysis and compare the results uh, to double check that we are, our findings are indeed accurate and what we have found is there is the conclusions are al almost identical um, we have looked at uh, slightly different regions uh, within Europe but um, there is clearly uh, there are some clear trends that came out of both researchers um, and and we find them very helpful um, I think the overall message uh, I take from reading the Alliance's uh, research is that companies and investors are not there yet. Uh, I think we've, we, in the recent years we've seen a bit of a uh, definitely a, a strong learning curve and we have seen significant amounts of improvement but it, again going back to the matter of making sure that this information is really suitable for decision making uh, both within the financial sector but also more broadly we have a long way to go and there are of course uh, there's of course great work being done uh, in the financial sector and I'm sure we'll hear from other speakers about what how they are using this information but really we need to scale up the both the, the, the quality of the information the tr and therefore the trust in the information and also so in some cases the the quantity uh, of, inf of information Looking at sort of the trends that we are looking at, uh, risk disclosure, of course, is a very important, and with that, of course, comes opportunities, uh, which are, I, th I think, as uh, in many cases, perhaps uh, sometimes even more important than, than risk uh, disclosures because they present a path forward to investment. But we do see, and I think you know, the, the Alliance's uh, report also shows that there is a lack of meaningful disclosures uh, of principal risks, and and therefore. Um, it is very difficult to understand where the risks are and to also understand what the business is doing to, to mitigate these risks, to manage these risks and really show to the, to the investment community that they are ready for the future, they are ready for the inevitable risks that might arise um, and they will come out a winner, winner at the end. In terms of KPIs and targets, um, and I'm sort of using the TCFD's lens to go through some of your findings, uh, Philip, uh, we, of course we have seen uh, Greater sort of this levels of disclosures on some of the very first generation metrics, you know, scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. But even when you go to scope three emissions, we see a sharp drop off, and um, and also both in sort of quantity, but also the quality of uh, of information. What I found very interesting um, is uh, around uh, the the companies that have uh, reported around uh, green turnover or green capex. Um, I think that's very interesting and very relevant as we go forward in the context of this of the taxonomy discussions as well. I think these will be very interesting um, areas of development, and so I think that will be an interesting uh, area to also uh, see how it develops um, in, in in future areas. And I, I would very much encourage everyone to look at those disclosures as well. 
So um, in general, I think the point uh, to make is there are pockets of, of really established disclosures now, but we need to make sure that we don't sort of assume that this is a job well done. Uh, we are not there yet. Uh, we need to celebrate success and we need to build on that. We have a good foundation, but we need to push for further to really able to integrate these risks and also to manage them and also to report them uh, in a transparent way to the market so that they can address and invest in, this, in the opportunities. Thank you, Mike. And if I, if I understand you correctly, one particular, let's say, challenging point for companies seems to be, uh, let's say, the parameters of risk reporting, how this, this, this can be done properly. So this, this may be the message for both companies as well as the policymakers who are aiming to provide some useful guidance in this regard. So without further ado, let's take a look at, uh, at our research so, so everyone can get a context of, uh, for what Mike has just said. Mike, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'll just, uh, I, just, I should just say, uh, I feel compelled to say that you're not only an apt commentator on this, you are very much engaged in all these discussions internationally at the EU level. So uh, your insights are very valuable. So please, let's move to the next slide. And uh, let, me, let me introduce to you the methodology that we have used for the research before I hand over uh, to Katarzyna Kluczka, who will present actually the actual results. So what you can see on the screen are the four lines or four blocks of questions that we have used in our research uh, methodology. Uh, the, the first one concerns the accessibility and quality and materiality of the provided information. Now, there are no clear standards for it in the, in the, in the legislation. So this is a mix of objective and subjective uh, assessment criteria uh, uh, implemented by our researchers from quite objective such as you know how the KPIs were presented to quite subjective as to you know how easy it was go, go to go through the report and find the information. Uh, the second block concerns the strategic perspective and again the legislation is not really clear what's required of the companies but this is a common feature in various international reporting standards and we look primarily at the, whether, at the question whether companies are providing information on climate risks from a strategic perspective, from the perspective of their business model, and what are the surrounding government's arrangements. So essentially information on the robustness of the of, the, of, of companies reporting uh, the, or governance. The, uh, the third line is really the, the content of the EU non financial reporting directive and the national transposition laws. We essentially look at the main legislative or um, categories of required data, that is policies, outcomes, risks, and KPIs. And we look uh, separately on climate, use of natural resources, pollution, and biodiversity matters. And we added a couple of further questions concerning the actual content of those disclosures based on the mentioned, the, uh, uh, the mentioned TCFD criteria. And we ask a couple of questions about the uh, disclosure of targets, climate targets, and their alignment with the public objectives, public decarbonization objectives. And of course, for the KPIs, We've, uh, we've, uh, we've looked at whether the most commonly used KPIs, such as GHG emissions, use of water, discharges to air, water, and so on and so on, are reported and in what quality by companies. Finally, as Mike mentioned, we look at the, uh, the question of sustainable activities, products, and services in the meaning of the, of the uh, EU sustainability taxonomy. We look at the economic data concerning companies' disclosure on, let's say, their green business activities. Right, so that's, that's the methodology, that's the logic that we have, uh, we have, uh, we have used. And uh, I'll hand over to our lead researcher, Katarzyna Klutska, to, uh, to lead us through the results. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, welcome, everyone. I will, as mentioned, present the results of this year's research. And if we could move to the next slide, please. Here we have the map of the countries uh, that we have assessed this year. Mostly these are uh, Central Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, as uh, you can see, most companies were assessed from Poland and Italy. And uh, those countries uh, in the past uh, provided less developed climate policies. So this is why we focused on them. And also the sectors uh, that uh, are seen also on the slide are those particularly exposed to climate risks for example, transition risks. And also uh, it is uh, visible that we have assessed uh, the most of the financial sector companies. And one of the reasons is because uh, 
European Commission sees that banks and insurance companies may both exacerbate climate-related risks, but also they can promote the transition to a low-carbon and climate-resilient economy and increase awareness of the transition. And if we can move to the next slide. Here we have uh, visible how the companies uh, actually disclose non-financial statements. So the non-financial reporting directive allows free ways to do so. And uh, as you can see, the most popular uh, way is to publish a separate non-financial report. And also we have the KPI presentation, which is one of the most relevant requirements uh, in the NFRD. So uh, we still uh, have to have in mind that uh, the data should be of high quality, useful, relevant, consistent, and more comparable. And also that uh, the EC guidelines uh, give us uh, key principles of how data should be. So for example, also balanced, or strategic and forward looking, stakeholder oriented, and last but not least, or consistent and coherent. So you should all have this uh, in mind if we will see at the further uh, results. So as you can see, the structure uh, isn't really uh, a good thing. Uh, for example, in Poland, more than nine and 10 companies didn't uh, provide a clear structure. And one of the reasons for it is that in Polish Accounting Act, uh, it is allowed for a company to publish a report based on its so-called own standards. So it's really difficult for the reader to compare and to assess the quality of the report because so it, it's difficult to see how the company actually uh, presents itself in comparison with the others. And to the next slide, please. So here we have uh, one of the uh, elements of the so-called uh, double materiality uh, perspective. So in short, uh, it means that from one side, uh, the climate change um, issue can affect uh, the company financially. So it's most interesting for the potential investors, but also the second aspect of this materiality is the environmental and social impact of the company, which uh, is crucial for, for example, NGOs and citizens and consumers. And here on the slide, we have this uh, financial materiality aspect, and uh, we should uh, take uh, especially a closer look to the third criterion, which is the explanation of opportunities related to sustainability challenges. And this is the weakest point, as you can see. So even if the companies uh, actually define that there is uh, some climate change risk or environmental one, they do not really know what to do, how to implement it in their own actions. So this is uh, a bit worrying. And to the next slide, please. So this is a uh, further uh, part of uh, bad news because uh, we can see that the board, so the body of power, doesn't actually also undertake any resolutions or, or decisions regarding sustainability matters. And it's not really this tricky question because it, it could be just any decision or, for example, existence of uh, independent uh, sustainability committee and yet the companies uh, fail to do so. And to the next slide, please. And here we have the three elements that the non-financial reporting directive imposes on the companies so in the terms of non-financial reporting. So we have policies, risks and outcomes and what are the colors. So we are uh, very, we are taking into consideration the, the quality and the uh, deepness of, of the information provided. So in navy blue, we have if the policies risks were specific, if they uh, indicated key issues and uh, targets. So in the light blue one is when a company provided some information, but it was rather vague, maybe a description and nothing quantitative. And in red, we have uh, when the company didn't provide any information on the subject. And to the next slide, please. So here we have, again, the, the level of, of the deepness of the information and the quality. So as you can see, as much as, let's say, half of the companies provided some description of policy, it wasn't uh, really uh, detailed and uh, it was difficult to see any specific issues and objectives. And if we could move to the next slide, it is also connected with the rubber or for results uh, in the terms of the outcomes, because uh, outcomes would be this uh, indicator actually to assess if the policies can be implemented. So 
mostly from my observation regarding, for example, Polish companies, it was that the uh, company has seen that uh, climate change is an important factor, but it didn't actually say how can your company uh, mitigate uh, the subject or how it can negatively impact on it. So this is definitely uh, there's a room for uh, improvement in this aspect. And if we could move to the next slide. Here we have uh, the target's juxtaposition, and that would be the actual mean to assess uh, policies. And we should also have them in mind the context of the overall goals of the EU policy. And if we see the last two criterions, which is climate targets uh, are science-based or aligned with Paris Agreement, and uh, also if the board provides oversight of those uh, climate uh, change-related risks, we can see that this is a certain weakness. Only Spain is the positive example in it, but all of other countries have much to do, especially Poland, where only two of the 73 companies actually provided some climate targets uh, aligned with uh, Paris Agreement. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Here we have risks. So again, this uh, quality, if it was uh, vague or if it was description of specific risks and to this specificness, if we go to the next slide again. Here we have uh, many, many criteria. So some of them were uh, mentioned in the European Commission guidelines, the specific ones, uh, the supplement on uh, climate uh, reporting. So again, here we also have to put it in the context of the EU decarbonization and uh, how companies are dealing with it in reality. So we should link, for example, the opportunities uh, that uh, climate uh, challenges present with the uh, with the breakdown of risks that actually is not really presented by any other company and also that the corporations do not provide the climate related scenarios so this is also uh, bad information and why those uh, risks are particularly important is that uh, it's one of the most in fact, uh, uh, important factors for the investors nowadays and so i have read the uh, research of ey which showed that even if in 2017, for only 8% of the investors, so climate related risks would be a factor for abandoning the investment at once. And so the next year, 38% uh, uh, would exclude such an endeavor immediately and 44 would reconsider it. And I suspect that in 2019, it was even of uh, gravier uh, factors. So companies should really take this into consideration that not disclosing anything is actually a bad sign for the investors as well and not only the bad information because if we have bad information that we can do something with it and we have some strategy then it's a good sign for hope and we don't see it really on this slide. And if we could uh, go to the next one. Here we have the financial sector risks. They were also taken from European Commission climate uh, guidelines, which suggest a number of uh, indicators for financial sector. So uh, as we can see, mostly Poland and Romania did poorly, but other countries aren't actually also uh, spending it. And uh, this fact, uh, taking into consideration that uh, financials uh, should uh, play this uh, very important role into transforming the economy, also worries. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, as uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the non-financial reporting directive requires uh, uh, specific uh, KPIs because they are actually allowing the reader to assess the company's uh, situation. So we, we can see that even though in the terms of greenhouse gases emissions scope one and two, companies are giving more and more concrete information, uh, they fail to or present results for GHG emissions from scope three. So this is the indirect ones, for example, from transportation and also from the emission intensity. 
And I have uh, read in the reports quite often that the companies have problem with uh, collecting the data and comparing it. But as we can see, Spain somehow, Spanish companies somehow uh, are able to do so. So probably this shows that we really need the standardization. And if we have those standards, then maybe the companies will really know how to present uh, the data that for now they fail to do. And if we can move to the next slide, uh, here we, I would like just shortly to present what other environmental aspects, apart from the climate change uh, we have assessed. So we had uh, use of natural resources, we had pollution and uh, biodiversity. And the latter was uh, the aspect mostly marginalized by the company. So they, for example, said, yeah, biodiversity, it's uh, an issue, but they didn't provide anything more. Then we have one of the most popular indicators, which is the use of water, but mostly it is still just presentation of the usage uh, in the offices and less than 10 of the percent of the companies actually disclose uh, risks to local water stress, which would allow us to assess uh, how this uh, use of water influences the environment and we are not able to do so. And last but not least, 55% uh, disclose a policy on pollution, but uh, less than 10% actually described uh, any targets uh, that uh, we could compare with other companies' achievements and goals. So again, this is not really useful for us. And if we could move to the next slide, here we have sustainable products and services. And I think it's important to mention that here we really do not uh, mean, for example, CSR achievements. We strictly mean uh, products and services connected to the basic uh, activity of the company. So we try to identify what would these sustainable products and services uh, would be for the specific uh, sector. For instance, for the financial institutions, it was uh, whether the investment, lending, and insurance and the writing portfolio contributed to climate change mitigation and to the transition. And we can see that even though 25% of the companies report on capital expenditure, only one in 20 actually includes information on turnover. So again, we, we, we miss the data to compare and to assess uh, the company's achievements. Thank you very much for this uh, rather quick uh, results uh, presentation. And I will leave the floor to Philip, who will present the cross-country uh, results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasia. Thank you very much. Um, it is a lot of data, of course, and <laughs> we'll discuss in the second half of, uh, of today's meeting uh, what data is actually most meaningful and what data we need to focus on. Uh, all the criteria that you have seen have been derived from the international standards that are very likely to, to influence the future EU legislation and the EU standards. That's why we focus on them. So even though we sometimes said, you know, this was not enough for us and so on and so forth, we are really looking at it from the perspective of what, what is expected of companies and what the financial markets will require. Anyways, quickly on to the cross-regional analysis. I'll now show you a couple of graphs that, uh, that show how the results of companies in different countries uh, um, are related to each other. And essentially, we could, we could see three categories of countries. One is the Mediterranean countries with Spain ahead of the others, but Italy and Greece following closely. Then there is a, there's a bunch of, uh, of countries from Central and Eastern Europe. And there's a small group of, com of companies, uh, sorry, small group of countries such as Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, and Slovenia that are really trailing, where there is really difficult to find at least one example of, uh, of a good practice among, uh, among companies. Um, essentially, even the best performing countries still have you know, less than 50% of their companies reporting really critical data. So here on the axis, you can, you can see uh, the questions concerning the climate targets or policies and on the on the horizontal axis it's, it's the quality of the of the policy or statement of, uh, of, uh, of risks and as you can see it's, it's all very uh, quite well uh, correlated on the next slide if, if I may ask we have visualized this with with colors and and uh, and uh, and uh, and maps now I hope the questions speak for themselves I guess one kind of a takeaway from this is that uh, while situation is well not ideal but kind of okay when it comes to the disclosure of policies it's much worse when it comes to the climate related risks and this is really where the west or south and the east start to diverge 
And if you look at the, at the let's say, long-term plans uh, in terms of decarbonization of companies' business models, this is really where, where, where the uh, Central and Eastern European companies are in red, uh, as, you can, uh, as, uh, as, as you can see. It's slightly better if you ask simply whether a company has a qu quantitative climate target, but of course that can mean just a target for the next year. It doesn't really speak of the quality of the target. Anyways, all these maps and all the data are available online. We'll show them to you. We appreciate that you could not possibly you know, digest it all. So this was just a very, very quick tour through, through our research and, and our results. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate and ask them in a the chat. We'll try to answer them in the next segment, uh, which will feature a number of, uh, a number of experts from different, uh, uh, different you know, business stakeholders. So, okay, <laughs> apologies. There's just one more slide that I should, I should cover in this regard. We've also compared the, uh, the, uh, the data with our research last year. There were about 168 companies included in our research last year and this year. And we've seen a, quite a significant increase of companies reporting on climate targets and specific information on their policies, as you can see. But most of these improvements were in single country in Spain. And that has something to do with legislative changes in that, in that country. We haven't seen progress on other elements, such as environmental due diligence or in, uh, in other countries. So that's, uh, that's perhaps a relevant finding. In terms of the conclusions uh, where Kasha uh, listed them <laughs> already in her, in, her, in, her, in her remarks, but essentially there's a lack of quality standards for forward-looking information and risks and targets. There are some methodological issues with some of the more complicated KPIs, such as scope three emissions and GHG intensity. Uh, there's really, really not a clarity on how to align the reporting on the risks with the, uh, with the EU decarbonization timeline and task with climate change scenarios. And <laughs> finally, there's a real confusion and lack of standards really on reporting on biodiversity and some other environmental issues. Uh, perhaps a clear signal from supervisors as to what are the minimum requirements might be also useful in this area. Anyways, let's move on. And I'll now moderate a discussion with, with five esteemed experts whose names you can, uh, you, can, you can see on the screen. I'll introduce them one by one and hopefully we'll have some interesting conversation. If there is anything you would like to ask them or that you would like to ask about our research, please write it in the chat or Q&A. I will try to answer those questions either now or later by email. So without further ado, let me move to our first speaker, who's Robert Sroka, who is the ESG director of Abris, which is a quite a remarkable investment firm in Poland. And Robert, you're focusing, your firm is focusing on a well-defined portfolio of investments and firms that allow you to oversee and engage with them in a, in a, in a quite a different way than, than, uh, than, uh, than uh, institutional investors usually can. Uh, but please, can you explain briefly how you work and what is yours, investors' perspective on sustainability data? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so it's great to be here. Uh, Abyss Capital Partner is a private equity firm uh, investing in Central Europe. So we currently have 15 portfolio companies. So our portfolio companies are located in Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, and Serbia. So, so we, we, we have a quite a broad view on the region. And I will present importance of non-financial data uh, from private equity investor perspective. Uh, so it would be interesting not only for the listed company, but also for the medium and big private uh, companies, which will, will look for the capital in the industry, which is uh, quite important. At Abris, uh, we implement ESG to the whole investment process. Uh, from due diligence through our value creation and monitoring till the exit. Uh, so the key objectives of taking into consideration non-financial data are risk management and also, which is really important, value creation of our investments. Uh, we've de uh, developed a dedicated tool called Abris ESG Scoring and the tool uh, which supports us analyzing and monitoring non-financial data. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see examples of the monitoring module of this tool. And for example, we can analyze ESG performance, which illustrates the change from the initial state to the current 
status of each company's ESG management. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we have found ESG risk map, and this risk presents 10 areas of ESG risk. Uh, it addresses both uh, financial impact and the risk probability. And altogether, uh, we analyze 500 non-financial measures uh, in each of our uh, investments. Among other, uh, the carbon footprint and climate change. I was asked by organizer uh, on this webinar of this webinar to present uh, in detail this, uh, this area. So climate change related risks are recognized by World Economic Forum as the most important for business. At the same time, it is important to treat climate change as a huge opportunity for companies. Uh, there are many reasons why we expect from our companies, our companies we invest in, to develop climate change strategy and report uh, appropriate uh, data. Uh, we are developing the climate change strategy on two levels, as you can see on the, on the slide. Uh, average level, it means on, on the fund level, and portfolio components uh, level. At the average level, uh, firstly, we implemented, implemented climate change to our responsible investment policy. Uh, then we prepare a climate change strategy, which is right now internally consulting. Uh, this strategy based on TCFD uh, task force on climate relation, related disclosure recommendation approach. Uh, so our ambition, uh, I think, I, and I would like to underline it, is to achieve net zero portfolio by uh, 2050. Uh, from today's perspective, it's a huge challenge, uh, but our goal is to take this first step uh, on this path. Uh, case is joint effort. It means that we cooperate with portfolio company. We implement the climate change strategy in impossible. It is impossible without close cooperation between investor and, and companies. Therefore, we educate our team internally and work together to develop climate change strategy in portfolio companies. And monitoring is also a key. It's a truism to say that what get, uh, gets measured gets done, but without goals, KPIs, we couldn't go forward. Uh, we also monitoring the progress on the quarterly basis and we use uh, for monitoring our obvious ESG uh, scoring tool. And tools, which is quite crucial, we try to su support our portfolio companies as much as possible in terms of ESG data uh, bo on both uh, levels, implementing uh, the strategy and also uh, disclosure the data. But in the same time, uh, it's the same uh, in terms of climate change. So we develop two tools one tool, carbon footprint calculator, and climate change risk and opportunities assessment tool. We prepare carbon footprint calculator. Calculator. The data uh, was collected by the companies. Uh, we receive uh, from them information about GHG emissions, and you can see on this slide, uh, and you can notice that the biggest carbon footprint has velvet tissue paper producer. Thanks to this tool, we can we have information uh, what is GSG emission per revenue and we identify the source of the biggest emissions. Thanks to this knowledge we know on which area we have to focus and, on and what kind of investment should be should be done in the future. Climate change risk is the, is the um, uh, second tool. Uh, it gives us opportunity to assess, uh, assess the climate change risk and the opportunities. Uh, this tool enables us to, uh, and portfolio companies to understand climate change risk and opportunities, and it based, as I said, on TCFD, uh, TCFD standards. And training without uh, knowledge, uh, without awareness uh, of this issue uh, in terms of company C CEOs, it would be impossible to, to go further. That's why we arrange, we build this aware awareness, we prepare the training for for companies uh, to improve their their skills in terms of analysis, ESG uh, ESG data and climate change uh, related risk and opportunities. So, 
to finalize this uh, this uh, short description, as you can see, there are a lot of work to effectively manage climate change related risk and, uh, and opportunities. And it's not easy job, but it uh, it's creates our value and allows us to avoid the risk community in the future. So uh, this is the long story short. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And if I, if I, if I picked up everything correctly, your strategy essentially requires working with the with the data on or with the assessment of the risk where you're following the TCFD recommendation or at least the criteria derived from it. But you also need clear goals, goals and KPIs in this in this area about some you know a long term long term goal. And this is this let's say are the essential management tools or data for for the uh, for the management. But I'm interested. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you or the companies are facing? When, uh, when engaging in this. And if I can ask you for a very, very brief reflection on this, that would be, that would be fantastic. Sure. Uh, I think um, the most important challenges are low quality, quality of, of data and connected with uh, this, and, it, and this cause problems with comparability of the data. And I think the, one of the biggest challenges is lack of understanding the meaning of ESG data by management boards and lack of integration of ESG data into company strategy by, by the board. And for investors, the most important challenges, challenge is to show the relationship between ESG data and the value of, the, of this company. So, and I think that there is no universal method uh, and there probably will not be. However, we try to take this dependence into account as I showed before, we estimate risk to the EBITDA of the, of the company. So I think the, the main, main challenges are on the stage. Thank you, it's, it's fascinating. And we could probably spend a couple of hours discussing your, your experience, but uh, this, is, this is just to, just to, just to, just to show, uh, show very briefly. Uh, your your strategy. So thank you very much, and thank you. let me move to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, next respondent, next speaker, who also represents a financial institution. So let me introduce Sarah Forschek, who's the sustainability officer at Raiffeisen Bank Austria, and uh, Sarah works at the at the subsidiary of Raiffeisen Bank in Croatia. And Raiffeisen Bank Croatia was one of the one of the companies that came out strongly in our research among the among the best reporting financial. Uh, companies, which is due to the centralized mm -hmm. approach uh, to the sustainability metrics and reporting in, in Raiffeisen Bank. Uh, but uh, in case of Raiffeisen Bank, it's calling it sustainability or non-financial may be misleading because uh, uh, it's uh, uh, because Sarah, you're reorienting your entire business and lending strategy towards activities that are critical to the transition of the economy. So it is very much a financial matter. Uh, for you as far as we uh, understand. And indeed, given the policy context, this represents a major area of opportunity for financial uh, firms and companies alike. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I suppose, how do you work with sustainability data? How, how does your work method actually look like? Hi, and good morning to uh, everyone. So uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, if a financial reporting actually shows the performance of the company, then the non financial reporting actually shows uh, who the company really is or it, it really shows the picture uh, of the company. So although uh, Raiffeisen Bank Croatia does not uh, publish its own report, our data is gathered uh, in a very comprehensive uh, Raiffeisen Bank International, who is basically our owner. So our data is uh, gathered into this uh, report. Um, this report actually consists of data from 13 network banks of Raiffeisen Bank International, including us, and uh, Raiffeisen Bank International's uh, participations in Austria. Uh, data is gathered uh, quarterly, so uh, we are basically reporting uh, all the data through a joint system and uh, we have um, numerous areas we are covering all in terms of uh, sustainability. So uh, basically what this report uh, consists of, um, so we are showing the impacts, uh, risks and opportunities from um, business activities, uh, business relationships. We show a management um, uh, measures and concepts, um, as well as sustainability related uh, activities. The report itself uh, is divided into three, let's say, main areas, um, which are called um, responsible banker, fair partner, and engaged citizen. 
So um, in this uh, responsible banker part, we actually expose our core business. So we are showing um, what is our business strategy, uh, what is, um, how are we dealing with economic sustainability, basically what are our products, who are we working with, how are we working with them. We are showing um, awareness and social responsibility in terms of our policies uh, towards, uh, let's say, um, compliance, uh, corruption, anti-bribery, uh, and so on. And of course, the most important part uh, of this is uh, basically uh, what are our lending products and uh, how are we working with, uh, let's say, this green financing. Um, the second part is fair partner, and this is our relationship toward our employees. So how are we treating uh, our employees? Uh, how are we working with their health and well-being uh, issues? How are we dealing with diversity and equal opportunities um, policies? Uh, how are we investing in their education and trainings? And a very important part is our in-house ecology. So through this report, we're actually showing, for example, um, how much water we're using, what kind of paper are we using, how much are we printing, um, how do we use uh, transportations, whether we use airplanes or we use cars, do we uh, support um, coming to work with, let's say, not cars. Um, and basically, we're showing what is our carbon footprint. This is, uh, this is very important. Uh, the third part is um, engaged citizenship. Uh, sorry, engaged citizen. Uh, this is basically what are we doing for the com uh, for the community. So uh, where are we donating? Who are we sponsoring? Um, how is the engagement of our employees um, towards uh, volunteering actions? So this is all covered um, in this very comprehensive uh, report. Um, this is in brief, how are we actually doing it and getting it, but why is this important? This is important because we want to show how are we doing things, why are we doing things, who are we working with, and uh, more important, who do we want to work with. So we are also showing um, what products we are, um, we can support to our uh, clients and uh, we are showing with which clients we would like to uh, work. I think that um, Non-financial reporting is extremely important because it really uh, shows uh, the basics of the company and um, how the company wants to work and who it wants to work with. So this is in brief, let's say. Thank you, Sarah. That was a <laughs> that was comprehensive in a in a very short amount of time. So th thank you for that. Um, you mentioned a couple of areas that you're covering in your in your let's say uh, work with the data and then presentation of the data at the RBI at the international level. Um, and some of them are, you know, of internal importance to, 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 the, to, the, to the bank. Some of them are, let's say, of importance to, to society as, uh, uh, as, uh, as such. But we are specifically interested in, uh, in, the, in the issue of carbon footprint and not, not so much in the, the actual carbon footprint of, of a bank, but rather in the impact of its lending, uh, lending, lending strategy. And we, we, sp we spoke about it uh, a little bit uh, before the call and you had, uh, some very interesting things to say about the RBI strategy here, but I'm interested. What what is it in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of uh, both data and reporting that you see that there are you know companies are challenge, uh, struggling with or that you are struggling with? Essentially, what are your needs in terms of you know the data availability and, and, and so on and so forth? And so, uh, if I can put in a context. We're speaking about the reform of the EU Financial Reporting Directive and the standards and how this can potentially be helpful. I think we heard it uh, many times during the discussion today. Um, I think it's very important uh, that we have a standardized approach. Um, if you can see, we as a company in Croatia, we do not have this report. We are uh, very lucky to have a very good owner who is very active in this area. And that's why our data is being published. But if you look at other companies in Croatia, very few of them um, are having such reports. And even if they have such reports, they're not standardized. So if you want to compare data, um, th this is difficult or basically um, impossible. And uh, also, I think there are many companies who are actually doing good things, but those things are not reported because they do not know how. So I think that uh, it's very important that we have some kind of regulation. I don't like to use the uh, word regulation, but regulation basically helps you 
to standardize and to put uh, data in context. So uh, it would be very good if we all have uh, some basic data we need to report uh, so that we can know uh, who are we working with and how those, comp those companies are actually engaging in their work. Of course, all additional data company publishes is very welcome, but I think this standardization and clear guidelines on how something should be reported is extremely, extremely necessary. Uh, and especially it will be helpful for companies in which do not have support of their owners or who do not have um, a clear, I think they don't even have the clear picture what is actually expected from them. And I'm sure that many of them are actually doing very, very good things, but simply don't know how to, to, to give it to the world, let's say so. Yeah, th thank you. And just to link this back to our findings, our research findings, in, in a country like Croatia or Poland or Romania or the Czech Republic, we've seen that about 20% of companies we've analyzed are providing specific information. It doesn't speak about the comparability of that information, but you know, the level of detail that allows you to distinguish, you know, what their strategy is about, what is their position, you know, do they qualify in our green or brown category and, and so on and so forth. And we're speaking about really big companies, the student stock markets. When it comes to, when it comes to SMEs, the uh, situation must be a little bit more complicated. So there's probably value in having an alignment in the society or in the, in the market as to what are a couple of data points that are really critical and really provide some, some useful insight. Of course, not everything can be communicated through data, but there must be, this, there must be such, such an element. Um, so thank you. Uh, I, it should I, be. I, this is, I think it's... One last word, please. Yeah, I just want to say it's, it's essential that we at least have some basic data on uh, which should be reported and how should we report them. That's it. <laughs> thank you. And with this, uh, let, uh, let, let, me, let me move us uh, to, uh, thank you very much, of course, and thanks to, to all speakers. Our next speaker is, doesn't represent a, a financial institution for a change, but a company, and a company in the, uh, in the, in the energy sector. And it's a, it's a Polish company, Tauron, Polska Energia, and our results show that Tauron is providing really useful information, decision useful info, uh, information uh, for the categories that, of information that we have just discussed around the risks, around the long-term climate plans, uh, decarbonization objectives. And it is all linked to the, let's say, uh, examination of economic risks and opportunities, which is, you know, which is so much needed for a company operating in, this, in such a sector, which is so exposed to uh to uh, to climate risk so uh i'm very pleased that i can that i can invite uh miss yolanda yolanda domirska who is uh, the head of environmental protection team and esg and climate area in, in particular at uh, at uh Tauron. so Ms. domirska for all of this of course so the Tauron strategy and strategic considerations rests on data so it would be really really interesting to hear from you what is the data that you collect, and why? And what is the relative importance of this of this uh, of uh, of the of the data that you collect? Uh, hello, I can see myself. Yes, that's good. Uh, how you said, I represent the parent company in a big uh, capital group, energy capital group, uh, which uh, have all elements of the um, electricity and heat. Uh, value chain from mining, uh, procuring raw materials uh, through generation, distribution and supply, uh, and supply to the final customers. So I have uh, another uh, point of view because I think that we don't need uh, any regulation because we are over regulated. We have so many, uh, so many um, reasons why we uh, collect this data. First of all, uh, as an energy sector, we monitor and collect a lot of environmental and uh, climate data because we are obliged to the uh, European and national regulations. Uh, also, uh, we use the, uh, the guidelines, Commission, uh, European Commission guidelines, and not, this, not always the same de definition or um, understanding in the same words. Uh, but uh, of course, we we are obliged to collect this uh, this data, not only um, uh, to to meet the standards in regulation, but also we must to uh, 
observe our goals and our new uh, strategy. How you said we put a lot of this uh, into the transparent way to show. But I have a problem uh, that non-financial environmental data uh, are, pu are published by two types of uh, activities, like us, uh, so hard industry, and also the financial in, uh, invest, uh, financial institution or IT institution. So I a little bit skeptical, uh, not for new standards, but for a one methodology for everyone, uh, because our impact on uh, on climate, on environment is completely different than, for example, IT company. Yes. Uh, so what's more. Uh, we are in EU ETS system, so we are also obliged to monitor uh, count CO2 emission in uh, in concrete uh, in concrete way. We are we are not free to define uh, to define the factors and not too free to define the methodology in some aspects. Um, So a new standard for everyone, a sustainable standard for everyone, uh, is for me a little bit uh, difficult to uh, to imagine. To compare uh, energy sector with, how I said, IT uh, branch. So if I if I understand you correctly, uh, you're saying that any any move in this in this area. Any kind of you know attempted standardization must be sector sensitive. There shouldn't be yes. you know one size fits uh, fits uh, fits all, which is very, very valuable input. And uh, I mean logically, <laughs> yes, <laughs> when, it it comes to, when it comes to decarbonization, I mean the energy sector has a quite a bit of different uh, risks and needs uh, compared to the uh, to the, uh, and to the others. May I ask uh, uh, one more? Uh, and it should be uh, relevant, relevant to our impact. Because uh, sometimes I have, uh, we are uh, assessed by rating agencies, which I think have the checklist, scope one, scope two, scope three. Yes, in our uh, in our um, example, the scope three, for example, for example, is irrelevant to scope one, because our carbon footprint is generally our direct emission not in direct emission. And because we have the full uh, value chain from mining, how I said, to the, to the heat and electricity, so scope one describe almost 99% 19, of our carbon footprint. Indeed, indeed. And uh, this is something that um, the, uh, the so-called project task force on the EU non-financial reporting standard, which is, <laughs> you have to be with me for, 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 for a moment, which is organized under the European Corporate Reporting Level, which I'm a steering group member of, which itself is housed by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. <laughs> that uh, essentially, it's a, it's a project which is advising the European Commission on what to do about the standards and how to develop is, uh, is uh, strongly reflecting this. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really, really gearing towards making a recommendation that the standards need to be relevant and sector specific. And absolutely, there was a question that we had ourselves in our research methodology, whether we should be actually asking about things like scope three emissions in this, in this, in this, in this particular research. Because when it comes to the energy companies, it's really about scope one. When it comes to the financial companies and lenders and investors, it's not really about scopes at all. It's about it's about a specific metrics linked to their investment, which can be really you know, expressed in scope. So all of this really really need to be really need to be um, really need to be um, let's say taken into account in this in this process. And it seemed to me what you have said about the let's say policy discoherence and multiplicity of requirements, which are further you know exacerbated by ESG rating agencies that are throwing in their own you know, proprietary uh, methodologies. All of this seems to be a symptom of, a, of, of the same problem, that there is simply too much out there and that, that, uh, that multiplicity is actually creating a confusion and making it difficult for companies to do something. But this is actually one of the, one of the things that European Commission explicitly 
pointed out as the reason for the intervention. So hopefully that's <laughs> their, their, their work will, will, their work on standardization will not mean more regulation, but rather, let's say, rationalizing of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the system. And indeed, this is something that the project task force on no-fine reporting standards is addressing explicitly. So I hope that, <laughs> that alleviated your, your fears a little bit. Before I move on, uh, is there is there any, any anything else the, uh, anything else you want to mention? I don't want to cut you off so before I move move further. No, no. Uh, I only make appeal to uh, to relevant and uh, dedicated indicators for 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 the specific sectors and specific uh, kind of in, impact of environment and climate. Absolutely. The relevancy depends on sector sensitivity of any, any future standards, is I guess the, the takeaway. So thank you very much. And again, we are quite impressed by, 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 the, by the level of reporting uh, by, by, by Taiwan compared to the peers, uh, peers in, in the region. So with this, uh, let me move to Daniela Sherba, who is the president and co-founder of the ARIR, which, is, which stands for the Romanian Investor Relations Association. And ARIR is bringing together all major corporate actors in Romania, those connected to the capital markets, and it has a mission of growing the Romanian capital market and increase the opportunities for private companies to access capital provided by investors. So Daniela, if I may, taking into account your mission, why is sustainability data critical from your perspective? What is the role of sustainability data in, in, uh, in facilitating these, uh, these relations? Hello and thank you for the invitation and very interesting discussion so far. I will uh, not uh, enter into too, too many technical details as you cover them very well, but I would I will let you know the perspective from a growing uh, and quite young association, I would say. Uh, we are just two, two years old, uh, but we gathered uh, 25 members in these two years and um, even in, if uh, in the beginning we thought that transparency and communication with investors is uh, the key, um, in the past year we noticed that um, investors are focusing more and more on uh, non-financial uh, information. And uh, from this point of view, we reorganized a little bit our strategy and um, we have a working group dedicated to sustainability. And also the stock exchange is very focused on that as well as they um, uh, signed a cooperation with an international rating companies. And, and this is because uh, in investment funds and pension funds require more and more such uh, disclosures. And from, from, this, um, uh, from this respect, um, our companies are more and more focused on, uh, on what is happening and uh, how they should uh, report. Um, as a young uh, market, um, we, we are still learning and we are still um, figuring out how to make the, the reporting uh, better and uh, how to uh, standardize it. Um, as, a, as the Romanian, uh, Romanian Investor Relations Association, we uh, issued uh, a rating that we grant all the listed companies. Uh, that rating is published on the stock exchange website. It's called Vector. And um, it's a rating uh, for the communication um, with investors. And we have uh, uh, grades from uh, 0 to 10. And one of the criteria is also uh, non-financial reporting. Uh, we have also in place in, in the country uh, the, the legislation requiring companies uh, with more than 500 uh, employees to issue a kind of report. It's not very clear what, is, uh, what, what it uh, should uh, include and, and how deep it should uh, look like. Uh, so from this point of view, um, definitely communication and uh, um, let's say uh, dialogue with the regulatory bodies in uh, Brussels uh, or association as you would uh, help uh, even our um, regulators at home um, communicate more the expectations. So one is the regulations and the other one are the investors' expectations with uh, which um, we are, uh, as an association, uh, care a lot. 
uh, and um, of course we promote uh, we promote uh, the the topics approached by the EU non-financial reporting directive since uh, the very beginning and um, as I said we are still at an early stage but nevertheless we encourage companies to look closely at this topic we also issued um, uh, let's say a guide um, with seven um, principles to be followed um, and uh, our focus is also to teach uh, small and medium enterprises so of course those big uh, companies are expected to uh, to become um, uh, to become compliant with all these regulations but uh, we uh, would like to have on board as early as possible also small companies because they are the future um, they are the future of our economy and uh, we want them to uh, develop uh, themselves as uh, responsible companies thank you and if i understood you correctly um you you, you mentioned that it is not quite clear what data or what information is really you know should be captured under this non-financial reporting uh, reporting obligation and indeed According to our research, Romania showed quite interesting results. We haven't had that many Romanian companies, just, just 15, given the composition of the industry and the size of the capital market. Uh, but among them, I mean, on, on average, the, the results were quite similar to other CEE countries, about 20% of companies providing you know, specific information. But there was quite a big divide between those that provided good information and those that provided you know, almost nothing that's, uh, that's, that's useful. So uh, in other countries, there was, uh, let's say, the gradient was <laughs> was uh, was uh, was uh, was smoother, smoother, smoother. So that uh, indicates, you know, certain uh, certain uh, certain uh, certain issues. So in this in this, you know, given this situation, what do you think are the key challenges that Romanian companies uh, uh, Romanian companies face? I would say definitely building an uh, an infrastructure that would uh, help them. Uh, grow and um, implement uh, um, the requirements because it's not just the disclosure is the strategy behind and in, in that respect we, we need to talk more about that uh, for example uh, this year it was the first year we introduced uh, an award for the best uh, non-financial report and we we were the only one in the country to do that um, and this is definitely a beginning uh, we had five companies that submitted their report. Others, um, they postponed it to the next year. But in order to, to come in front with a report, you need to work maybe one, two years in the back to, to, to show um, um, you know, a, a very good result, of course, and something to, to be at the level of expectations of international community of investors because Romania became an emerging market this year according to FTSE uh, Russell classification and of course the expectation towards uh, transparency of our companies is higher and higher and we are very uh, happy to, to build international alliances uh, with yourself as well um, as uh, we need more um, expertise of because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we just need to see uh, what other companies did well. And I, con I congratulate uh, companies uh, that are present today and uh, expert commentaries um, of how they did well. We would be really happy to host them uh, in Bucharest as well um, to discuss with our companies. Yeah, I see the, the combination of being an emerging market with these massive shifts in the financial markets and focus on sustainability and companies that perhaps don't have any experience and don't know where to start is just quite, <laughs> quite, a, quite, a, quite a trio and uh, perhaps some clarity as to where to begin, what, is the, what are the essentials, what are the key data to focus on can be in this, in this regard very useful. Thank you yeah, ideally, yeah, yeah I, I, we, we have a lot of energy companies, for example, listed, uh, and uh, the, there is a lot of uh, expertise in the energy sector, but uh, nevertheless, when talking to, to local investors, they need to to see how to look at other companies as well. So, so the difference across sectors are also uh, important, and they should be uh, somehow treated in, in the regulations, if possible, of course. Thank you very much. And that's the same message as we've heard from Tauron. There's really a need for this sector sensitivity. Some 
high level recommendations are probably not going to cut it. So thank you very much. Uh, great to have you and we'll continue the conversation. And with this, let me move to our last, uh, last, last speaker, last person who will provide her reflections. So it's my pleasure to, 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 to invite Jacqueline Katzpszak from the, from the Polish National Contact Point for the OECD guidelines. The Polish uh, National Contact Point, or for short NCP, is housed with the Ministry of Development Funds and Regional Policy uh, in Warsaw, I suppose. At least that's where we have met when we had the chance. <laughs> Hello. Uh, and let me also say that the, um, that the, uh, that the OECD, OECD National Contact Point's mission is to promote and educate uh, educate on the OECD instruments in this area, especially the guidelines for multinational enterprises, as well as a set of sectoral, highly specific due diligence guidelines for both environmental and human rights matters. And in this regard, the Polish NCP is actually organizing an international event with, uh, with the Latvian and Czech NCPs and a couple of others for the business audience on the actually application of these, of these, of these, uh, of these issues. We'll send you a short note after the after after the event in case you would be interested to join the meeting it's just uh, it's in two days on thursday but uh, uh jacqueline if i may uh since the polish ncp is among the leading institution in the CE region in this uh, in this uh, in this in this regard um you're very well positioned to to explain what is the rep importance of reporting or sustainability disclosure in this oecd framework for responsible business conduct Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation and uh, possibility to be a part of this very important, I think, uh, event you organize. Uh, uh, and thank you for mentioning the conference we are organizing as the OECD National Contact Point uh, because this year marks the 20th anniversary of the creation of the OECD National Contact Point Network and uh, above all giving them a very unique opportunity to consider notification of potential violation of the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises by the companies. And uh, to, as you said, uh, the, the participants of your event will receive uh, the link to register to our event. We invite you very, very much to be the part and to, to, to look what we can present. Uh, answering the question why the um, uh, corporate transparency is important from our perspective, the OECD National Contact Point, I will try to, uh, maybe I will start from the very, uh, uh, from the very uh, important uh, issue. Uh, just mentioning the chapter three of the OECD uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, the purpose of this chapter, the, the, maybe I will start also that the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises today, it is the oldest um, standard for the responsible business conduct. It was uh, adopted by the OECD members in um, 1976 and the last uh, update of the guidelines was uh, uh, introduced in 2011. Uh, however, in the chapter three, uh, uh, the purpose of this chapter is to encourage improved understanding of the operation of the multinational enterprises. We can read in this chapter that enterprises should be transparent in their operations and responsive to the public's increasingly sophisticated demands for information. This commentary for this uh, chapter, uh, from my experience, really proved that the expectations of stakeholders are really very important. And um, they are becoming mm, today more and more, perhaps not sophisticated, but I will say they are becoming more and more specific. And we can even say that they are somehow unexpected by companies, uh, that stakeholders will expect from the companies to disclose some kind of national uh, non-financial uh, information. However, what is really very important uh, to emphasize, this is how the business should be done in 21st century. We know that there is no room for the business as usual, and uh, there are more expectations for responsible business conduct. But also what is interesting, and I would like to draw your attention to the fact that OECD guidelines are clearly emphasize two areas for, of information disclosure. 
The first set of disclosure recommendations call for timely disclosure regarding the corporation, including the financial situation of the company, uh, the performers, ownership, governance of, uh, of the company, and etc. But the second set of disclosure of communication practices, uh, which are set in the and recommended by the OECD guidelines, uh, are related to the areas where reporting standards are still evolving, st still developed, such as, for example, environmental and risk reporting. This is particularly the case with the greenhouse gas emission uh, as the scope for the monitoring is widening to cover direct or indirect uh, current and future product or uh, corporate emissions. But then another example can be also issue of the biodiversity or the issue of due diligence. We have now this ongoing discussion uh, on the European Commission level about the mandatory uh, due diligence uh, regulation in the field of human rights and environment. But speaking uh, uh, from the expectation, from the level of the expectations of uh, uh, stakeholders in this regard, we should note that there are more and more notifications coming to the OECD national contact points regarding potential violation of the chapter three of the OECD guidelines, which is regulated to the, which is uh, related to the uh, non-financial disclosure. Of course, these cases, the OECD national contact point are receiving, they are not only the cases related only to this chapter one. When you will go to the OECD database uh, regarding to the specific instances, um, in the period of, of uh, this 20 years uh, we are celebrating uh, this year, uh, they were uh, over 450 specific instances, specific uh, this cases brought to the NCPs, and uh, the issue of disclosure is uh, is on the uh, is the subject uh, uh, is in the group of the first five topics most often covered by the OECD by the notification to the OECD NCPs. On the first place, we have the employment relations and. Uh, general policies and human rights, then the environmental chapter, and then is the disclosure chapter. So it proves again that the informations about the company's performance, about the company's behavior are really very important. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, I mean, from your experience, if you could name one challenge that you think that uh, this is the biggest or that you see that companies are uh, struggling with, and perhaps that can, that can bring us to the, <laughs> to the end. Speaking from my personal uh, experience, I will say that the main challenge for the companies still is the uh, disclosing information about the human rights. Uh, the human rights is uh, the issue of human rights. Uh, I think is uh, still not well uh, known among the companies, and also not well uh, understand by the companies. So there is still, I think, um, uh, I think it is a really big challenge for for the companies, and also the need to educate how the companies should assess the risk uh, uh, in the area of human rights. Uh, uh, as you know, we can connect also the issue of human rights with the climate issue, because the uh, the, uh, the the right to live in the clean uh, environment is becoming uh, recently uh, as the one of the very important human rights also. Uh, so I think that the, uh, that this is the, the the most important topic. But in general, what is really very important for the companies it is the information. Um, we heard from the from the previous speakers that they are some sectors uh, that they are over regulated. They don't need the new regulations in regard of the non financial information. Uh, I will agree that uh, that. The regulation, it is not only one way to 
to introduce some changes on on the market. It should be uh, it should be done in the different and combined way, uh, as the European Commission sometimes uh, is sometimes is. Uh, I'm very sorry. I forgot to to mute my mobile phone. <laughs> So very sorry for that. Um, so what I would like to say that uh, European Commission is uh, uh, is advising uh, to the public authorities to introduce some smart mix of uh, standards. It can be the regulation, but also it can be the uh, the other solutions which could be helpful for the companies. Um, uh, to, to include, to improve the uh, non-financial uh, reporting uh, behaviors and practices. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very clear. On the, on the matter of human rights due diligence and reporting, in the specific context of reporting, this will likely be subject of the potential EU non-financial reporting standards. The, uh, the, this, the debate is aiming towards essentially the quality principles for disclosure of policies, outcomes, and so on and so forth, rather than the standardized reporting in terms of, you know, uh, specific APIs and so on and so forth. So that that should hopefully provide clear guidance to the companies while you know leaving them to consider their own uh, situation. So thank you very much, and uh, let me let me let me quickly read through the uh, read through the uh, questions that have been submitted over the chat. The first question concerns the, uh, concerns the uh, uh, well, I'll, ju I'll just read it. <laughs> uh, so I have understood that the financial actors present here forward exhausting non-financial reports. In what way do you expect the EU legislative reform to re enforce, enforce and lead to the more rigorous and more standardized reporting by no-shows? I'm not quite sure what no-shows mean, but essentially if the European Commission goes ahead and develops concrete reporting standards, that will specify what kind of data need to be disclosed and that will provide an objective benchmark against which any enforcement can, can be, um, on which uh, enforcement can be based. Right now, we know the enforcement is really complicated, but with the standards, companies will have both the, let's say, security and clarity and the, uh, and the enforcers or supervisory authorities would have something to hold companies uh, to account for. The next question is, uh, is uh, concerns the, uh, the discussion on the sector-specific standards and specifically the remarks from uh, the, the Mr. Mirska from Tauron. And, the, uh, and it concerns scope three. And essentially, essentially there's an there's a example given of Innojev Poland, which is the owner of a small distribution network, but also a trader of electricity and gas. And for them, the largest emission source are in the scope three and has, you know, in accordance with the TCFD recommendation, emissions of all scopes should be given, I suppose, by all companies. And in principle, that's, that's true, uh, at least that's my perspective. But of course, the key is the question relevant, and that perhaps require a more uh, subtle assessment of the position in a value chain that the company has in a particular sector. So, if a company is, for example, a producer of electricity and is using coal to produce the, that electricity, uh, uh, the uh, electricity, it's quite a different position to that of a, of a, of a, of a company uh, operating a distribution network. I mean, they are in one macro sector together, the energy, <laughs> the energy production and distribution, but obviously for the distribution scope three is much, much more relevant than for scope one. So one way how to go about this, and really this is all open question. This is all something that is currently being considered by the commission and the project task force on NFR standards, is that the standards could also provide either a guidance for assessment of materiality or a downright materiality thresholds for specific data. That means if the company exceeds certain thresholds, it should indeed report on certain issues. This may be a more, more nuanced way how to how to how to you know um, distribute the requirements among different sectors or other individual individual uh, uh, companies. Um, so, Ms. Demirska, is, is there anything you would you would like to say in in this uh, in this in this regard? Since that <laughs> yes, one was mentioned. I Yes, I want only comment that it's not uh, our opinion; it's our practice. Not longer than yesterday, I had a question: Why Tauron doesn't report uh, Scope Three? Yes, 
and it's not only the guidelines, not only our report, but also there is the third uh, side, it's the rating agencies, which uh, uh, sometimes assessments, assessments not always in the same way, yes, uh, they use different uh, different methodologies and our practice is that they have the checklist how I said before and they check from the guidelines every uh, every point not uh, with uh, analyzing the, re the relevant le level of this so it's only my question that different rating agencies uh, in different way use these guidelines thank you very much so Philip, I, I may add can... something to this point, Please. because I think uh, uh, I have one very important information that um, uh, we understand very well that maybe there is some expectation on the on the business side to prepare some kind of uh, some kind of uh, sectoral guidances uh, for the companies to. Uh, to uh, prepare the non-financial reporting, but um, uh, but also what I think would may be helpful for the companies, uh, uh, there are some tools already existed on the market, uh, especially from the OECD uh, standards for responsible business conduct. We have several guidances uh, the OECD has already issued for the extractive sector, for the uh, uh, garment and footwear sector, for the agriculture, also for the financial sector. Uh, and they are not the guidances how to report, but they are the guidances how to uh, introduce the responsible business conduct in the company's operation. And this could be really very helpful to prepare the companies to prepare their report. Because to report something, we need to have our performance, we have to need our results, we have to need uh, policies in place. So I really uh, encourage the uh, companies to look on the OECD sectoral guidances. Also the GRI, um, the most popular uh, reporting frameworks, which is the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, on the level when they uh, had the GRI 4 uh, standard, they were also the sectoral guidances, how to report. And uh, as I know, the GRI is preparing now uh, also the new uh, sectoral reporting guidances. So it could be used for the company. So what I think still, again, I will repeat that uh, maybe not, not um, importantly new uh, regulations or new guidances or new uh, uh, and new uh, recommendations are, are needed. Uh, first, we have to look what, what already is existing on the market and try to make the best use of these uh, tools what we have already. Thank you very much. And we're a little bit over time, so we'll, we'll need to wrap up. So thank you very much. There's one more question or a comment. Uh, uh, and it's a question whether we can provide some examples of good practice. And indeed, this will, we will do in uh, and probably we'll, we'll, we'll send a comprehensive guidance with such examples in, 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 in January. Uh, as regards the comment on the global reporting initiative standards, indeed 70% of companies we've analyzed this year report to rely on GRI standards, but these data or these claims are not correlated with the quality or meaningfulness of data. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's, the GRI standards are very comprehensive and they cover great part of this, of this information, although not you know, entirely. Uh, but the problem is sometimes that, you know, it's not clear to companies which data are more important than the others. And so I guess the, 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 the job for the European Commission is to, let's say, build on what is out there and really specify which elements are, are key, including who's supposed to report on scope three emissions, what are, the, what are, let's say, the triggering criteria for companies, just to go back to the previous question. So with this, uh, let me hand over to, to my colleague Bartek for a final wrap up. And thank you very much. Thank you to all panelists. Thank you to everybody who is in the audience. Thanks a lot, Philip. Um, I would like to thank to all speakers and also to um, our experts. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, in the end, we have even exchange of um, uh, different opinions. It was very nice. 
We have learned today uh, what weaknesses the directive um, has. We have learned today uh, what reporting um, weaknesses um, has. Uh, we knew why it is important to, to report non-financial information, especially from the perspective of investors. We have also uh, learned um, what's the plans of the uh, EC, the policy makers in coming months, in coming months um, to amend the, the regulation. Uh, we won't uh, leave you without anything, without any um, good um, advice from our side. So as Philip said in the beginning of year, January or February, we'll publish our guidance uh, and uh, we will um, we'll share it with you. We'll stay in touch with you via email. We'll inform you about the upcoming uh, NCP OECD uh, conference. And please visit the Alliance for Corporate um, uh, Transparency website when you can uh, read the report. You can analyze the database uh, we published there. The database is, um, you, you can filter the information, information then there. So it's, it might be very useful uh, to see how um, in different countries, in different sectors, uh, um, by different sizes of companies um, uh, report. So you can also learn something for, uh, for yourself. Thank you very much for today. Thank you that you stayed um, with us uh, to the end. Uh, goodbye.